Hello EU4 players, my name's Riemann, and today I want to start a new series where I show off a mod from the community. One of the greatest things about EU4 is how moddable it is, which leads to a wealth of different options for how to play the game. One mod that's been talked about a lot recently has been Mayo and Taxes, which recently released a major update, bringing a second edition. In this video, I'm going to cover the features of the mod, my personal thoughts on how this changes the game for better and worse, and what sorts of players I think would be interested in the mod and who should give it a try. Here's my analysis of Mayo and Taxes 2.0. Mayo and Texas is a total overhaul mod to EU4. It changes nearly everything in a significant way to such a degree that it's probably the most ambitious mod that exists for the game. I've looked high and low, but unfortunately it doesn't seem like there's any good main features list anywhere, so I'm going to do that here with a little blurb about what I think are the mod's most important changes. This is by no means comprehensive, but it should give you a good feel for the general outline of what the mod is going for. First off, there's been a lot of changes made to the map. The starting year is 1356, which causes a lot of changes to certain countries. For example, France starts out heavily decentralized, and Castile and Sweden are locked in civil wars. To the east, the successor states of the Mongol Empire are still going strong, with the White Horde and Blue Horde exacting tribute on their neighbors. Further into Asia, the Yuan Dynasty has retreated north, and a power vacuum has consumed China, with no one dynasty being yet able to unite the country. Back west, the Timurids have not yet risen, instead being replaced by states like Fars, the Chupanids, and the Julearids. And in Anatolia, the Ottomans are but a small bailiff competing for hegemony of the old Sultanate of Rum. There are thousands of new provinces, and the layout has changed in that they are more asymmetrical with snaking borders and exclaves from the dynastic inheritances characteristic of Europe. There's also much more use of wasteland for mountain passes and rivers, which creates tactically interesting choke points. Further south, the Sahara has isolated oases connected by straits, which is more realistic than colonizing vast swaths of sand. I've never met an EU4 player who didn't like maps, so going through all the changes will be entertaining for any who tried this mod out. The next major alteration is the POPs system. Instead of having province value be divided into base tax, production, and manpower, Mayo has rural, urban, and upper class POPs. These confer varying levels of tax and soldiers for your nation, with rural pops mainly providing food for the rest of society, urban pops being the main productive workhorse of a country, and the upper class being the main receiver of education, which I'll talk about in a bit. Now, switching to population would be a fairly large achievement by itself, because it removes one of EU4's main abstractions and really differentiates between stratifications of society. However, the truly amazing part of the system is that it's completely dynamic. Population will rise from prosperity and long periods of peace, and it will fall from plagues, famines, and being sieged down by enemies. Closely related to the pop system is the new wealth system. Money now circulates in the economy, being represented as a province modifier that allows for automatic construction of buildings and leading to more taxable income for the state. It, like population, increases from prosperity and decreases by the ravages of plagues, famine, and conflict. Provinces are not the only thing that now has a stock of ducats. Estates have been redesigned from the ground up, having their own treasuries, armies, and goals. In vanilla, estates are basically cattle that you milk from time to time for points and advisors, but in this mod they act as actual forces in your country. They can build buildings and provinces, assist you in times of conflict, or rebel against you if they think you don't represent their interests. They can also demand privileges, concessions from the crown that will give you short-term bonuses, but which slightly poison your country in the long term. You can try revoking privileges later on at the cost of stability, which has also been changed. There's no longer an increase stability button. Instead, it increases slowly over time and can essentially be spent to revoke privileges. It's also worth noting that this all takes place through the Cossack expansion's interface, and thus it's highly recommended you own that expansion to play this mod. It's not technically required, and everything can still be done without it, but it will be through a much more clunky interface. For warfare changes, there are two main ones. The first is that Mayo includes a mod once known as War Dynamism, which makes provinces automatically flip to the control of another nation if certain conditions are met, like for having the correct culture or for reenacting conquests that occurred historically. The second major change is that looting is much more important. At the start of wars, you're given a choice of how much you want your soldiers to loot, which is important because looting takes many more ducats than it does in vanilla, and it can kill population, destroy buildings, and leave regions devastated for years or even decades. At the end of the war, you can decide how much of the spoils go to the treasury and how much gets reinvested in the provinces, increasing their wealth. 
This all means that wars for looting are much more viable, and can lead to some areas becoming poor after years of abuse, while others will grow rich from plunder. After you've conquered areas, you'll find that coring has changed too. Coring and overextension now represent martial law, keeping down unrest in exchange for money and manpower. These can be quite costly for a small nation, but you no longer get bad events or tons of rebels from exceeding the overextension cap. Instead, the main anti-blobbing mechanism for the mod is a new feature called Communication Efficiency, which represents how difficult it is to get orders from your capital to any given area in your empire. It leads to higher base autonomy in distant provinces, and it gets worse the further you get from the capital and in rough terrain, but it gets better with naval connections and improved roads. Religion has also been heavily changed with the inclusion of the Die Gratia mod. This includes new religions, new events, and religious minorities. Instead of having provinces be monolithically religious like entirely Sunni or entirely Catholic, minorities exist as a province modifier, with their strength and benefits being drawn from their size and if the country tolerates them or not. Conversions have also been tweaked to now only change the religion of a province by about 20% every time, so you have to continuously send missionaries to convert provinces instead of it happening all at once. The mod also features court and education expenses, where you have to ensure your seat of power and the scholarship systems in your country are up to standards, with low funding causing penalties and high funding causing bonuses like better diplo relations and faster AE decay for a nice court and better army tradition and cheaper tax for good education. These values change slowly over time and represent a persistent cost you have to finance or cut back on depending on your goals. Finally, there are a multitude of smaller changes worth mentioning. Mayo has a new musical score covering a variety of the more underserved areas of the game, like medieval hymnals, New World Nahuatl themed songs, and Asian melodies. Sieges are slightly different in that not every fort projects a zone of control and that sieges are slightly quicker, but diseases for the attacking army are much more severe and asymmetrical. Annexation happens quite a bit slower and is now a two-part process, where you have to first complete an integration that takes a base time of 40 years, but can be sped up or slowed down by many factors. Colonization has changed to straight up prevent you from colonizing provinces like in the Sahara or the Congo jungles before you have a high enough tech level, and you'll find the Americas have much fewer natives than in vanilla. Institutions are more numerous with a longer time span, and one of them, meritocracy, actually starts in Asia, to give China an edge in the early game. The trading system features many more trade routes, and many of the trade goods come from highly developed cities that generate centers of production. Ideas have also been changed to have completely different values, and there's a system of progression where some ideal groups can only be unlocked by taking other groups, allowing for further specialization, and in some cases causing trade-offs where you have to pick one or the other. Now, this description definitely isn't exhaustive by any means, but it should give you a good idea of the major features and what the overall philosophy of the mod is. If you hear people on the forums or Reddit talking about the mod, you've probably heard it described as being like a completely different game. And while there are tons of changes, I'd say it's more halfway between vanilla EU4 and another game. There are many alterations that can completely revitalize entire ways of playing, but it is still very recognizably an EU4 experience. The core Europa Universalis gameplay is all there, but it's been stuffed to the bursting point with new features, content, and redesigns. So now that you know what the mod is, I want to tell you what the mod isn't to dispel some potential worries and so people don't go in expecting something the mod won't deliver. First, the mod is not huge on micromanagement. In fact, I think there might even be less micromanagement than vanilla when you take estates into account. If you were worried that all the new features would make it tedious to administer a big country, I'm happy to say that's not the case. There's some very complicated stuff going on, but it occurs almost entirely under the hood. The intricate nature allows the player to impact things in various ways, but it's not like you have to manage pops like this is Civ. On the other side of the coin though, Mayo does not suddenly make peacetime interesting. The mod is clearly trying, with peace being more powerful, but EU4 is a war game, and by and large that hasn't changed. You might think it has early on when you're trying to figure everything out, but after you've devised a method that works for whatever goal you're chasing, it doesn't take much effort to do so. For example, most of my interaction with all the new ways to spend money centered mostly around building up my capital in the early game, and things were so expensive that I only had to do this once every 5 to 10 years. Moreover, even though estates are beefed up, interactions with them are still on long cooldown timers, and there are some easy tricks to render them docile. I can also confidently say that Mayo is not more balanced than vanilla. Even in the relatively short 20 hour period I played the mod for, I clearly saw some strategies being far more viable than others. 
For example, the base interest rate of 8% means that loans are almost never a good idea. But apparently the AI didn't get the memo, so one of the easiest ways of winning wars is to just fight defensively for a few years while the AI rapidly commits economic suicide by building way more troops than it could afford and plunging itself into an unstoppable debt spiral. Additionally, while the ideal groups have been changed significantly, there are still some standouts. My old friend Quandi has been nerfed into the ground, with the manpower bonus in particular being 10 times weaker than in vanilla. But leadership, on the other hand, has plus one tall general pips, including an extremely valuable guaranteed siege pip, on top of several other bonuses. Moreover, the mod makes religious conversions quite a bit more difficult, but tolerance is even more beneficial than in vanilla, inundating you with half price advisors, free random unrest reductions, money from temple building, and jizya taxes. The only tangible benefit trying to convert people had was not related to internal stability at all as it should have been, but rather the Holy War cast a spell for a 25% reduction in war score cost, which would have been pretty nice considering the war score costs of things are absurd. And that leads to the last thing the mod doesn't do. Mayo does not make conquests more difficult, it just makes them agonizingly slow if you don't do it in the way the mod wants you to. This is a very important point that I'll discuss at length later on. First though, I want to cover the things I like about the mod. I'm pleased to say I truly do enjoy the vast majority of the design decisions it has to offer. My broad thoughts on it are probably my best point of praise. Simply put, Mayo takes everything that makes EU4 interesting and unique compared to other strategy titles like Civ or Total War and amplifies it. There's less abstraction and things flow more plausibly from a historical basis than from arcade style magic. If you'd graph abstraction versus simulation, Total War would be on the left, Civ would be a little further in, then you'd have EU4, and then all the way over here you'd get Mayo. If you think EU4 doesn't have enough history, then this is probably the best place to look to satisfy your itch. Its focus on population and urbanization means playing tall is actually viable now. I've never been super huge on that playstyle myself, but I did give Milan a quick spin, and the difference from vanilla is stark. Normally, Milan is, at best, a regional power, but here it's an absolute juggernaut because of its well-developed cities. This allows for a lot more asymmetry when it comes to power, and I could very easily see an experienced player being able to defeat France with just an Italian city-state. I'm also a big fan of how the mod handles the intersection between communication efficiency, centralization, and estates. I always kind of hated how overextension just serves as an irritating rebel factory, and that it didn't really matter how large or small your country was in regards to how much land you could take before the really negative effects started kicking in. Now, since uncored provinces represent martial law, a large nation could theoretically leave trouble areas uncored for a while if they could afford the manpower and money requirements. For Mayo, the big blob curbing feature is communication efficiency, which causes more autonomy the further away from the capital you are. Normally, in pretty much every other game I've tried, I've always hated distance from capital penalties. I hated it in Civ 3 where cities would turn into useless corruption holes. I hated it in Rome Total War where provinces would become eternal rebel factories. It's just an unfun mechanic in a lot of games. But Mayo actually does it well for two reasons. One, you can reduce the penalty significantly by building better roads, ports, and capital buildings. And two, it doesn't just make the money vanish into the ether. Rather, autonomy makes money go to the estates, who can still use it to make buildings and develop provinces without instruction from the central government. But it's still a good check to blobbing because the buildings aren't always going to be the ones you want, and the estates like wasting some of the money on troops, fancy clothes, and treason. Hence, it all feels like an integrated game feature rather than an arbitrary beat stick against large empires. Furthermore, it makes centralization feel like a very attractive goal. The early modern period was all about the development of strong centralized states, and vanilla kind of drops the ball on this. Going along with this, stability is so much better than in vanilla. One of the great casualties when Paradox decided to go with the mana system was disasters. Back in EU3, you'd occasionally get all the stars to align against you to plunge your country into a period of unrest that you couldn't get out of just by pressing a button. Mayo is the first time I've ever experienced the civil war disaster in EU4, and it was a lot of fun to defend my country from the inside for once. There are a lot of other features I enjoyed scattered around the mod. The idea system where some unlock later on or can only be taken after you have another idea group is something I hadn't really thought of before trying it out here, but now that I have, I'm kind of shocked that vanilla doesn't have it. I like that you have to spend money on your court and you get tangible benefits for doing so because expensive palaces were a major factor of the time period. I enjoy the more numerous provinces that have more wasteland geography between them that creates interesting tactical challenges and opportunities. I like that looting can be so powerful that it actually gives you another viable reason for going to war besides just to take land. 
I like the soundtrack that adds much needed variety after listening to the same music for thousands of hours. Some songs, like the main theme you hear when loading up the game, are good to the point of being instant classics for me. Finally, I simply have to applaud the mod for the sheer amount of content and what they've been able to do with the game engine. There's clearly a ton of stuff here that I'm sure took countless hours of designing and testing, and it's pretty awesome I can get it all for free. Additionally, from one modder to another, the way they've twisted eu 4 systems to design features that were never meant to be added is extraordinary. Many players won't realize this, but even simply having a button on the province view that leads to an event that shows province info and decisions takes a deceptive amount of effort to include because it was never designed to work that way in the first place. With all the stuff like dynamic wealth, calculating the amount of provinces owned in certain regions, and modeling populations lower than 10,000 is impressive and allows for much more nuance. With all that being said though, the mod does have a few problems. Firstly, it's a little rough around the edges. By that, I mean you'll occasionally notice this isn't a professionally developed product made by a salaried dev team that has access to the source code. Not only are there all the crashes and bugs from vanilla, there's also an added layer from the complexity of this mod. For the most part it works fine, but I did crash about twice as frequently as I would have normally, about once every 5 hours. Beyond this, the most common bug I came across was missing localization, with one time I led it up to be greeted by 6 of these events. I also hear there's a particularly nasty bug going around with colonization in regards to innate fertility that permanently and severely stunts new world gameplay, although this bug and others may be fixed when the mod comes out of beta. Furthermore, while they've clearly done the best they can in this regard, the interface is still clunky when you have to go through events that have been jerry-rigged as menus for things like estates and stability points. The next major issue Mayo has is in how good it is at explaining things. Some aspects, like religion, are fairly well documented, but others aren't. Mainly, it has vanilla eu 4s problem of explaining what everything is when you hover over it or click to read about it, but how you actually impact it is left as a mystery. For example, there are tooltips that tell you in no uncertain terms that farming efficiency is critical, but info on how you'd go about improving that is conspicuously absent. Another example is, I actually went a full 10 hours before finding out that dispatching runners makes it so you can core immediately. Given overextension can be crippling for small powers, this seems like something that should be made abundantly clear. The bigger issue is that it lacks the EU4 wiki where everything is indexed so you can see values on stuff and other details you didn't think to look for. The information is all out there, but it's scattered across long, unindexable YouTube videos, Reddit posts, and forum threads. And while there is a wiki, it's woefully incomplete and out of date. Pretty much everyone could tell you how critical the EU4 wiki can be to learning the game, and not having that resource hurts. Next, while I did enjoy the vast majority of design changes and features, I strongly disagree with how they've chosen to deal with Cassus Bellies, War Score, and overall expansion. The way this plays out is subtle, so I want to explain it fully. Mayo gives extremely powerful, situational CBs for nations that historically expanded in certain directions. For example, the Ottomans get the Sultanate of Rum CB that halves the AE and War Square cost of conflicts in Anatolia and Greece. Indian Sultanates get their own CB for uniting Hindustan, allowing them to take land for one-fifth of the AE and War Square cost. Practically all European majors get de jure CBs that also allow for one-fifth AE and War Square cost of provinces in their region. All of these CBs seemingly exist simply because historical conquests occurred that way. The CBs are numerous enough that almost every nation can get access to one of them, but they're locked to specific tags or cultures to take specific lands and specific regions. With these CBs, conquest is so swift it's trivial. Without these CBs, conquest is agonizingly slow. It took five 100% war score wars to conquer Iraq as the Ottomans. The Jalayarids were far too weak to stop me from obliterating them every time I fought them, but I had to contend with 15 year truces between each conflict. This leads to the age old problem of games becoming very boring because nobody poses a threat. Vanilla EU4 solves this with admin efficiency and the imperialism CB to make larger goals like rebuilding the Roman Empire or conquering all the trade company nodes more palatable and interesting. While Mayo has admin efficiency and imperialism, they're toned down and the earlier starting date means they come a century of game time after you expect them to. To give you an example of this phenomenon, in my first game as the Ottomans, I spread like wildfire to pretty much the historical borders in a century using the CB, war dynamism, and special events. Of particular note, I found the Ottos get a decision to just magically integrate the entirety of the Mamluks if they hold their capital. That's right, integrate, meaning a 1300% war score opponent vanished, and I took no aggressive expansion, got free cores, and even inherited their troops. 
But after a century of hyperblobbing, the prospect of any further expansion being extremely slow and pointless made me feel like the game was done by about 1450. There wasn't anything interesting left to do, so I left for my next game. This time I wanted more of a challenge, so I tried the Korean nation of Tamna on the island of Jeju, who starts with the terrible generic national ideas and with fewer pops than Ryukyu. I figured out a way to latch myself into the Chinese events even though I was Korean, and within a century I conquered all of China. I took a nation of 30,000 people and made it a nation of almost 100 million, with over five times the population and forest limits of my nearest competitor. But then, again, I ran into the problem of having no real opponents, and expansion no longer being fun. Korea would have taken six wars to take over completely, forcing me to wait through a century of truce timers. Now, before somebody posts that image macro and accuses me of being mad that I can't blob as fast as in vanilla, I'd like to reiterate the part of the mod I take issue with as a combination of how fast and easy it is to blob in the early game, and how slow and meaningless it is in the late game to where things get boring much more quickly than in vanilla. I should also mention that I asked about this on the Mayo subforum, and they said they were going to make changes to Cassus Bellies, but what those changes are going to look like, and when they'll materialize, remains to be seen. There is one other main issue with Mayo, and that is performance. No matter how fast your computer is, you're going to notice the game running much slower. I've heard there have been some optimizations in version 2.0, and while I can't speak to how much better it is now, I can give you the results of a test I ran. For reference, my CPU is an i7-4770K, and I ran Observer Games for both Vanilla and Mayo and tested how long it took to get through one year at certain speeds. The results are shown here. You can see no matter what, you're in for a significant slowdown. It should also be noted that the performance drop is very uneven, with some days or months feeling almost like vanilla, whereas you can have some days in the middle of the month inexplicably hang for 3 or 4 seconds, which can get very annoying after a while. However, I should mention the percent change in performance is lower if you're playing on a slower speed, so some people will notice this more than others. And of course, this is just one test with one CPU, so your mileage may vary, but it should give you a general idea of what you're in for. So who do I think should play the mod? Well, I'd honestly say everyone with a significant amount of hours in EU4 should at least try it out. Even though it has problems, my overall thoughts are strongly positive because it's just exaggerating all the things that make EU4 unique. So it's very plausible that anyone who likes EU4 could fall in love with Mayo. With that said, however, there are some demographics it targets more specifically. If you've been yearning for more historical simulation and less abstraction in terms of things like population, wealth, and religion, this is the mod for you. If you value role-playing more than blobbing and playing efficiently, you'll be pleased with the changes this mod makes. If you wished alternative gameplay styles, especially playing tall, were viable, then you owe it to yourself to give this mod a spin with a nation like Milan or Granada. Finally, if you prefer to play slower, like on speed 2 or 3, then you'll notice the performance drop quite a bit less, and given that's probably the biggest flaw of this mod, that will most likely lead to you thinking much more highly of it compared to someone who prefers speed 4 or 5. Now there are some types of people I think won't like the mod as much. Firstly, players new to EU4 should stay away, at least until they learn the basics of the main game. Mayo is more complex, and not having a wiki to look up things on the fly could make for a frustrating experience. Also, people who like EU4 for a challenge and expansion more than for roleplay are going to be disappointed due to how awkwardly lopsided conquests are as I already mentioned, and the AI simply does not seem to be able to keep up with things like higher interest rates and the smaller army sizes. Additionally, people who don't like railroading are going to notice that not only is there more of it in some places, it can also be more obnoxious. I already mentioned how I don't like how Mayo deals with CBs, and railroading conquests to be really easy within historical boundaries is the primary issue here. It also railroads colonialism in two ways. First, it locks out most nations from taking exploration ideas until later in the game if they're not historical colonizers like Portugal, England, etc. Second, it just straight up prevents colonizing in some areas like coastal Africa, Pacific Siberia, northern Japan, and the Amazon until very late in the game. Sure, this makes for a more historical progression, but the mod does this by throwing a brick wall in your face instead of simulating historical reasons why these things occurred. Finally, if you usually play on speed 4 or 5, then the performance drop is going to be noticeable and irritating. For what it's worth, I did get somewhat accustomed to it after 20 hours, but the nuisance of having those frequent few second pauses as the game engine buckles and groans under the sheer volume of calculations never went away. I imagine the price of having a much slower game could prove prohibitive for some. I'll put links in the description to where you can download the mod. I recommend everyone checks this out if you've played EU4 a lot, because this is clearly a labor of love that tons of work has gone into. 
I enjoy a lot of what they've done, but Mayo does have problems, and whether you'll prefer it to vanilla depends on what you're looking for in this game, and if you're fine with the slower speeds. That's all for my review, my name's Riemann, and until next time, thanks for watching.